it's awesome to be together, and uh, we are excited to continue with our series of faith here. If you're visiting with us, we've been going through Hebrews 11 and talking about all the heroes of faith and really encouraging the church in that way. And today we're going to continue that. We're going to be talking about Deborah and Bar- Barak, and uh, it's an amazing story. Uh, the subtitle could be Teamwork. And uh, that's what we're going to be talking about today with Deborah and Barak. And it's, if you read in Hebrews 11, he says, And what more shall I say? I do not have time to talk about Gideon, Barak, Samson, and Jephthah, about David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, and gained what was promised. And so he goes through all the, the fathers of the faith that went, from the beginning and through the promised land, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Moses. And then he goes through the, the period of the judges, and we're going to be talking about the judges today, uh, Barak and, um, and Deborah. And it was just amazing as we were going through and just reading the passage, it's just they couldn't have done it without each other. One needed the other, and so as we were going through this, we felt like, hey, we're going to do, we're going to kind of replicate that here today, the teamwork. Danielle and I are going to kind of do it together. Uh, So I guess I'm going to be Barack, and she's going to be Deborah. (laughs) And uh, turn over in your Bibles to uh, Judges chapter 4 as we get started. And uh, when you get there, we're going to say a prayer that we're going to get going. Uh, Father, I do thank you for this time to be together. Thank you for uh, the amazing life that you called us to live, God. Help us to live a life of faith. God, help us to persevere. Help us to take steps of faith today. Help us to grow in, in being a team with one another and loving one another. God, I pray that you use us today and in a powerful way, that it won't be us speaking, but it will truly be you and your spirit. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. In in, uh, Judges chapter 4, turn over to Joshua. Judges chapter 4, starting in verse 1. He says, After Ehud died, one of the former judges, the Israelites once again did evil in the eyes of the Lord. So the Lord sold them into the hands of Jabin, king of Canaan, who reigned in Hazor. And commander of his ar- the commander of his army was Sisera, who lived in Harasheth, Hagoyim. Because he had 900 chariots and had cruelly oppressed the Israelites for 20 years, they cried out to the Lord for help. So that's the situation. Danielle's going to explain a little bit of the background as we get going. All right. Well, in preparing for this, it just was helpful for me to understand what's the historical biblical context of this story of Deborah and Barak. So I just want to share with you, some of you may know it, but it was just helpful for me. So obviously we have the Israelites that were led out of Egypt by Moses, and they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years with a lot of war. And then finally crossed the Jordan and entered the promised land where they were led not by Moses, but Joshua at that time. And once they arrived, Joshua divided all of the promised land up into different pieces of property for each tribe of Israel. And after that, Joshua dies. And we see a pattern definitely throughout the Bible that when there's godly leadership, the Israelites tend to do pretty well, like us. And when there's not godly leadership, They don't do very well, but that's another lesson for another day, too. But getting back to our story, Joshua dies, and then the people revert to doing very evil things before God. And so then God raises up judges to lead his people. And so kind of the order of leadership in the Bible is it starts with the patriarchs, then we have the judges, and then the kings. And we are going to talk about the judge Deborah today. And she actually was the judge right before Gideon, who we spoke about last week. So that's a little of the context. And, 
You know, I don't know about you, but when I think about the Israelites wandering in the wilderness in war for 40 years, I picture that once they got into the promised land, that that would be this time of just ease and comfort. And I picture, like, shouldn't it be like the land of milk and honey, and we're just eating and drinking and relaxing, and we're on vacation? But that is not exactly how it worked, and as we know, it doesn't always work that way with God. So I want to read this scripture in Judges 3, 1 and 2. It says, and this is obviously the chapter right before we're reading. It says, these are the nations the Lord left to test all those Israelites who had not experienced any of the wars in Canaan. He did this only to teach warfare to the descendants of the Israelites who had not had previous battle experience. And so I just find this to be a really interesting spiritual point for us because I don't know if you can relate, but I can often think that, oh, once summer comes, it's going to be a little easier. Or once the kids go back to school, it's going to be a little better and more peaceful. Or or when I'm an empty nester, when I retire, and we look for this life, or I do, of ease and comfort. And while I am grateful that God gives us seasons of, in life and he does give us vacation and, and needed rest, but, but God, it's clear to me that as long as we are alive, he wants us to be battle ready and we need to be prepared and that we're going to be fighting battles until we die. And I think if I prepared myself more and thought more like this, then I wouldn't be so discouraged or my faith so challenged when the battles come and when the times of testing. And I think I also see in scripture how oftentimes when we're really comfortable and not fighting, those are usually when we're losing the war spiritually rather than really willing. So I just appreciate that um, God wants us to always be prepared to fight his battles. Okay, turn over to Judges chapter 4. Thank you, Danielle, for the intro. It was awesome. In Judges chapter 4, starting in verse 4, it says, Deborah, a prophetess, the wife of Lapidoth, was leading Israel at the time. She held court under the palm of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in the hill country of Ephraim. And the Israelites came to her to have their disputes decided. She sent for Barak, son of Abinoam from Kadesh in Naphtali and said to him, The Lord, the God of Israel, commands you, Go, take 10,000 men of Naphtali and Zebulun, Zebulun and lead the way to Mount Tabor. I will lure Sisera, the commander of Jabin's army there, with his chariots and his troops to the Kishon River and give him into your hands. Barak said to her, If you go with me, I will go. But if you don't go with me, I won't go. Very well, Deborah said, I will go with you. But because of the way you are going about this, the honor will not be yours, for the Lord will hand Sisera over to a woman. So Deborah went with Barak to Kadesh. When he summoned Zebulun and Nephali, 10,000 men followed him, and Deborah also went with him. And our point number one is rouse the warriors. They were getting the people ready, and they were calling them to go to battle. And so Deborah's going to talk, I mean, Danielle's going (laughs) to, see, we're, we're, we're in character right now. So Danielle's going to talk about Deborah, and I'm going to talk about Barack. Well, I just have to say, I'm really honored to talk about Deborah. I feel like she's a definite hero in the faith. And it's just really been an honor and privilege to look at her life and share about her. And, you know, so what do we see from the scriptures that Scott just read? Um, It says simply, she was a prophet. And by definition, a prophet is one appointed by God himself to be his messenger. And as a prophet, influence and authority did not come from rank or wisdom, education, wealth, but it simply was you were chosen by God. And so Deborah was chosen by God. She was God's leader of Israel. She connected with God in his spirit, 
She tried to make God and his laws known to God's people and to help them and warn them about obeying God wholeheartedly. She was wise. You know, we see that everyone came to her to settle all their disputes. And I, I just can imagine that is not an easy job. And I think she must have been very knowledgeable about God's laws and what they were. She had to be fair, hard line, had to be patient. But she also, she really knew she needed Barak and she needed others. I see her as a great strategist and that she knew that they were better together. And, you know, I think that sometimes we can all really want to be very independent. And I know that's a weakness of mine. I think at times it can feel a lot easier to just do it myself than to work with other people. And I think it's really hard work to lead together. You know, I really even appreciate Scott so much wanting to do this together. And it would have been so much easier for him to just do it himself. <laughs> it took a lot of extra time and effort to do it together. But I think in any relationships, whether it's marriage or with roommates, friendships, co-workers, really being unified and working together takes a lot of work. But I think we know that we're always better together when we persevere and we work for unity and that we tap into strengths outside ourselves. So I think Deborah really shows us um, just that they were really better together. And also about Deborah, she was just incredibly fearless. I mean, she was gutsy. Um, she was the one, it says she was the one that was going to lure Sisera to Barak. So she's the one who's going to call him out and have him chase her, I picture, till she leads him to Barak. And she was, she was hardcore. She was willing to put herself on the front line no matter the cost. And I just see her as incredibly faithful to God. You know, faith and fear are opposite. And she was fearless, and I believe because she was faithful. And I love the scripture that says that perfect love drives out fear. And Deborah was trusting and completely convinced that what God promised was going to happen. And I think like Gideon, you know, obviously we see that their weapons were much inferior. Like Gideon, it didn't matter if they had jars or real weapons, if God said he's going to bring victory, he's going to bring victory. And I know I'm incredibly challenged by this area of Deborah. And honestly, it's really one of my heart's greatest desires to really have my first instinct be trust and faith in God, rather than the negative thinking and the fear that I can so often give into. And I want to be a warrior for God like Deborah. And I just feel like she's an incredible daughter to God. I'm so inspired by her. And honestly, she's someone I really can't wait to get to heaven to meet and understand more of her life and her story and even talk about this day in the Bible. Thank you. Amen. 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 It's going good so far. <laughs> Barack. And uh, I don't know what you think about when I say you're going to go to war, you're going to go to battle. A lot of times when I hear that, I think of like Superman and he just goes by himself. Or Clint e Dirty Harry, Clint Eastwood. I mean, he goes alone. But they didn't go alone and God doesn't want us to go to battle alone. That's a bad thing. Going alone and saying, I got it all figured out. I don't need you guys. I'm going to go to battle on my own. What would you be thinking? Like, man, that's a prideful guy up there. He thinks he's got it all figured out. He's deceived. You know, if we said that publicly, we would never say that out loud. But in our hearts, we say, okay, we're going to get ready for spiritual war. We think of ourselves and what we need to do and not thinking that we need to also get each other ready, that we also need to go together. And that's the thing that I appreciate about Barack is that he was humble enough to listen to the word of God no matter where it came from. Deborah was clearly the prophetess from God. That means that she got the word straight from the Lord, and she told them to go for it. Get 10,000 guys and go take the hill. And he said, amen, let's do it. Because it didn't matter who brought him or sometimes... We feel like the word has to be brought to us in just the perfect way or we're not going to listen. 
It's got to be like, you know, you got to use the sandwich method and say something positive, and then you give the challenge, and then you give them some encouragement at the end. And if you don't do it in just the right way, you're being harsh. No, the word of God is the word of God. Yeah, we want to try to do it in the best way possible. But I, I hope that we're humble enough to listen to the word of God. It doesn't have to come from the preacher. It doesn't have to come from our family group leader. It doesn't have to come from a man. It doesn't have to come from a woman. It doesn't have to come from somebody old, somebody young. Whatever it is that is our hang-up, that's the thing I see in Barak is the word of God is the word of God. And he didn't try to tear down the messenger. He just accepted the word of God and went with it. And I, I love that heart. And, and, and God calls us to have that heart that none of us are above the word of God. That when we read it, when someone shows it to us, he calls all of us to follow it. And this was a time when Israel was incredibly weak. They had been oppressed for 20 years. They had been, you know, they, were make, they probably would, would be tempted to feel sorry for themselves to make excuses, to look at the 900 chariots and go, oh my gosh, they have these, this iron technology that we don't have, we're so outmatched. You know, and sometimes when we're weak, we can tend to feel that way about ourselves. Oh, I've been this way for so long and I can't change. And you know, there's, we have all the reasons and you know, the, the nine, it might not be 900 chariots for you, but it's that boss that's so unruly or the situation that, you know, the, the, the physical situation that you've had for so long. God calls us to have faith no matter what the situation, no matter how long that we've been in the situation. It says that for, when you read chapter 5, it says for 40,000 Israelites that they could not find a shield or a spear. That they were so unprepared for battle that they didn't even have the tools ready. And that was a song, it might have been an exaggeration, but God wants all of you and me to be ready for battle at every time. You know, it says that whatever his situation, that he wasn't going to get the full glory because of however he was going about it. And I don't really know that after 20 years of oppression that it would really matter who got the glory. I would like to think that Barack would be happy that we're all saved now, we're all delivered you know, sometimes we feel like we have to be the one that gets the glory or, or does the great thing, and we can't rejoice. Let's rejoice with God's victory, whoever it comes from. It's not about me. It's not about Barack. It's not about you. It's about God. And wherever God has a victory, I hope and pray that he, I believe that he celebrated with the amazing victory. He knew that he needed help. He wouldn't go without Deborah. That's a smart man. She was the connection to God. She was, in a, in a sense, the connection to the word of God for him. Why would you go without going with God, with the words of God? Man, I, I would want her to go with me too. You know, in, in so many areas, we need one another to help us, to inspire us in your groups, in your families, in your households, that God wants us to go to battle together and he had an amazing respect for Deborah. You know, I mean, he was called to respect her as the prophetess of God. So in that day, you think it's weird today to hear that? That was a weird thing. That was extremely rare. That happened like there was only one other judge that was a woman. And so it was challenging but he had a, an amazing respect, and I believe God calls us to have an amazing respect for the sisters in the room. As, as the guys, he calls us to set an example of what respect for God's daughters looks like, for what God's people looks like, for, for, the, for your faith, for your perseverance, for your uh, warrior spirit. You know, and, and, and he was not just doing it because he had to, but he was doing it because she was worthy. You know, you don't become the, the leader of a country by accident. You know, God raised her up for that certain time 
And that's just an amazing respect. This is, we're in a world right now that doesn't have a lot of respect. Whether you're talking about gender issues, whether you're talking about political issues, God calls all of us to be men and women that give respect and aren't divisive and, aren't, and can be uh, honorable in that way. So I appreciate that, that about Barack. The amazing story is that as he went on the journey, it says that God called him out of the hill country into the river valley to fight this battle. So if you picture the battle, the other guys have all these chariots. And so if you get on flat ground, how's it looking for you? Not too good. You feel like we're going to just get run over. But if we stay in the mountains, that's a good plan because they can't come up here. But God, through Deborah, called him to go down into the riverbed and put himself in a disadvantageous situation where he could be tempted to be thinking, this plan's horrible. It doesn't make sense. I can give you all the reasons why this is a bad idea. And can't we do the same thing? Sometimes if we don't come up with the plan, we feel like it's a bad plan. And we have all the reasons why it's not a real good plan. And yet, because he had faith, even in what he thought was a bad plan, when you read chapter 5, it says that there was a downpour that came, and Barak's name actually means lightning. And so as they went into the battle, God sent this amazing lightning storm, as he had before, rain, maybe there was hail involved. And so all those chariots that they were intimidated by were useless, and they won the battle. So an amazing... Uh, story of faith through Barak. Danielle's going to introduce another hero in the story. Yeah, there is an interesting twist in the story that when Deborah tells Barak that God will deliver Sisera into the hands of a woman, I think we naturally just expect that that's going to be Deborah. And then kind of out of nowhere comes another woman, Jael, And she's definitely another heroine in the story who is fearless and definitely a warrior for God. And Scott's going to talk more about her. You know, there was something about this chapter as I was reading it that this lady was so impressive to me. And uh, and if you will read along with me, losing my place, in Judges 4, uh, verse 17. It says, Sisera, however, fled on foot to the tent of Jael, the wife of Heber, the Canite, because they were friend- on friendly relations, because Jabin, king of Hazor, and the clan of Heber, the Kenite, were on friendly relations. Jael went out to meet Sisera and said to him, Come up, my lord, come right in, don't be afraid. So he entered her tent, and she put a covering over him. I'm thirsty, he said. Please give me some water. She opened a skin of milk, gave him a drink, and covered him up. Stand in the doorway of the tent, he told her. If someone comes by and asks you, is anyone here, say no. But Jael, Haber's wife, picked up a tent peg and a hammer and went quietly with to him while he lay fast asleep, exhausted. She drove the the peg through his temple and into the ground, and he died. Barak came by in pursuit of Sisera and Jael went out to meet him. Come, she said, I will show you the man you're looking for. So he went in with her and there lay Sisera with the tent peg through his temple, dead. And I don't know what it was, (laughs) but this lady's awesome. (laughs) I mean, she came up with a plan. She was hanging out. She saw the bad guy coming by and she invited him in and took care of business. And if you think about the way that she took care of business, she was relentless, right? She wasn't just, she didn't just want to kill him. She wanted to make a statement, and she did, and that's what I liked about it. God called her to be a warrior, and she stepped up. She broke a lot of the rules of the day, though. It's not very polite to invite someone over to your house and then kill them. <laughs> Especially back then. But any time, that's not a good idea. She went against a peace agreement that her husband came up with with the foreign leader. 
uh, next door neighbor, I guess. They were tribes back then, wasn't countries. But she went against a peace agreement to kill this guy. You know, but she helped to turn the tides for Israel. She followed Jehovah God over what the tradition was and what the agreements were at the time. And she got rewarded. You know, so we thought it was going to be Deborah having this amazing victory, but it was this other woman, Jael, with a lot of convictions. And Charles Spurgeon did a sermon on her called Sin Slain. And he talked about you can't be content with just beating sin. you got to kill it. And it wasn't good enough just to beat them in battle, beat sister in battle, but jail finished the job. And God calls all of us with the sin in our lives and the sin in the lives and those around us to be warriors, not just content to win a few battles, but kill the sin in your life. Take care of it. Have no mercy on the temptations that are coming your way. Go after it. Be a warrior for God. My question to myself and to you is, are you a warrior? Are you a warrior for God? Do you have a warrior spirit? Are you ready to go to battle for God? And that's not literally, we're not going to go out and, uh, you know, uh, do what jail did here. But to go after the, the sword of the spirit, to go after the, the word with a vengeance, to go after prayer and be a prayer warrior for God, to go after loving the lost and loving your friends and loving the church, to go after serving, to go after giving your heart, to not sit back but step out, to not wait for someone to ask you but for you to ask someone else. To not be a bystander. Jail could have been a bystander. She could have just watched it go by. And, I mean, the army, was Israel was winning big time. They probably would have caught up to the guy. She could have left it for somebody else, but she took her opportunity. And I pray that as you're here today, that you'll take an, your opportunity for God. That you won't let it pass you by. So thank you. Uh, be a warrior for God. That's point number one. Point number two, the blessings of service. And we're going to see there were some incredible blessings of service here. And Danielle is going to talk about Deborah again. All right. And we do only have two points, just so you know. <laughs> um, well, we're going to talk some about Judges 5 and the song of Deborah. And I just want to read this one verse and talk about it. It says... Um, Villagers in Israel would not fight. They held back until I, Deborah, arose, until I arose a mother in Israel. And I love this verse. I just think it's phenomenal. And it really makes me think of even different stories. Do you have my, um, you know, of like David and Goliath, him slaying the giant, or Braveheart, or... One more. Wonder Woman. Um, <laughs> but it just, it's inspiring to me because it does create this image of someone that would stand up and do something. And that when someone stands up, that those people that are afraid, that it's amazing how people can be brought together in unity and have great victory. And I really love that about Deborah. She was a leader that stood up and led the charge for God. And, you know, I really know I want to be that kind of person, and I know we want to be those kind of people that will be a light to this world and that will stand up for God even when it's not popular and that will help others to really follow God because of, of how we live. And, you know, I also really love in this verse and where it says that I, Deborah, arose a mother in Israel. And I think it's just interesting. She wrote this. And she called herself a mother in Israel. And she could have written um, a judge of Israel, a prophet of Israel, a leader, a warrior. And she was all those things. But she chose the word mother. And I just love that I think that highlights her feminine qualities. And, you know, it's a little bit of speculation because all we really know is that she was chosen by God. And that was enough. But I like to think that she probably possessed some great qualities of a mother and that 
even that that would really help her in settling so many disputes because I think she probably had just an unwavering love for her people or children, that she had patience, gentleness, and an unmatched fierce protection of those around her. And I think you can't be good at settling a lot of disputes if you're quick-tempered or frustrated or you really don't care about people. And I think she probably possessed those. And I like to think of Deborah, I think she was maybe like the ultimate mama bear that was willing to sacrifice herself for others. And I think that she was maybe someone you didn't want to mess with, that you really wanted her on your side. And you definitely wanted her to be with you in battle because God was on her side. Thank you. Amen. In Judges uh, chapter 5, it says, When the princes in Israel take the lead, when the people willingly offer themselves, praise the Lord. My heart is with Israel's princes, with the willing volunteers among the people. Praise the Lord. And God loves when we are unified in our leadership and in our followership. When we willingly offer ourselves, when we make those around us, we make their lives a joy. When we're a team for him. And it's so inspiring to see when people come together. You know, I was encouraged uh, Friday night. We had one of our first uh, singles events in a while. We had a game night over at April and Dora's place. We had a lot of fun. And we actually, we had a lot more fun than I thought we might have. <laughs> this was our first event. You know how it is when you're kind of putting yourself out there and you're like, okay, is, everybody, is anybody going to come? If they do come, are we just going to sit around looking at each other? I mean, is it going to be fun? Uh, you know, and it was amazing to see everybody there and just having a great time. I mean, it was so loud in there. You know, poor Louie, you know, where he couldn't hear straight or whatever because it was just people were having a great time. And I was just so grateful because that says a lot about all the singles and, and, and some of the marrieds that were there, just your heart to want to give and to want to be used by God and to want to, you know, enjoy the life that he's given us and bring friends out. And, you know, it, it, I left there feeling so faithful about what God's going to do. And I met one of the guys that was there once ago on our hunting ministry, too. So that was kind of a side bonus. You know, God gives you those little side bonuses. Uh, but I was thinking about it. I was like, wow, imagine if it were reversed. Imagine if we had an event and nobody came or half the people came and it wasn't real fun and you had that kind of awkward silence and you had your friend. You got to try again. There you go. She was there, actually. So there you go. She can speak. You got to keep, you got to persevere. But my point was, it's so less inspiring when people aren't willing. We still, you still got to do it because you're doing it for God. But it's so much more fun when everybody gives their heart. And so that's for all of us. Whether we're talking about your family group, whether you're talking about your, your class on Wednesday night, whether it's Kids Kingdom, whether it's ushering, whatever, we're still going to do it without you, but it's a lot more fun with you. And the amazing thing from this event is that when you go through the rest of chapter 5, half the tribes showed up and half the tribes didn't. And he goes through tribe by tribe. And one that sticks out, you know, in ver he says, uh, uh, in the districts of Reuben, there was much searching of heart. Why did you stay among the sheep pens to hear the whistling of the flocks? And you just get the idea. It says, Asher remained on the coast and stayed in its coves. So you get the idea that the people of Reuben, they just stayed home. They hung out. They took care of the sheep. They did the day-to-day -day normal stuff while this amazing victory was happening. That Asher stayed on the coast. They, they were in the coves. They were protected. They protected themselves. And they missed out on an amazing victory. And it says the people of Zebulun risked their very lives 
I don't know about you, I want to be one of the ones that risked their very lives, not the ones that stayed home for God, right? How about you? God calls us to be Christians that don't stay home for God, that we risk our lives. We put ourselves out there, and it says, Naphtali did also on the terraced fields. And it kind of just gave me a vision that after this event, that these terraces, I don't know if you've seen those fields, I just picture like the fields in Asia where they have the very hilly ground and they have the flat and the stairs up to the top. And I just picture these fields afterwards being like hallowed ground. Like, yeah, that was us. We did that with God. We were up there. Remember, look at those hills. We were out there. Every time you went by it, you would just think, remember that rainstorm that came by? Remember how God showed up for us? That's how I, I believe God wants us to be as a church, to have those miracle stories. And we got so many of those stories. You know, I think of the 25th anniversary service and just think, man, we, we gave our heart to that and God showed up. And I believe as we give our hearts that God's going to show up more and more. He wants to send those miracle storms. He wants to do those amazing victories to, to bless our lives. So decide, let's decide in, in your heart and in mine, I wanna, I'm not going to stay home for God. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put myself out there. I'm going to be one of the willing volunteers. I want to see God move. Imagine the guys that stayed home and they hear about this amazing victory and they're like, oh, my gosh, what were we doing? We stayed home. They, they, they heard about it, but they didn't see it. You know, I believe God wants all of us to see his hand. And we're going to close out in Judges 5. You can read the 23 and 24, but in 31 it says, May all of your enemies perish, Lord. May all of you who love, may all who love you be like the sun when it rises in its strength. Then the land had peace for 40 years. That after this amazing victory, they had peace in Israel for 40 years. They changed history for God. You know, and now as we take our communion together, we get to celebrate a different kind of peace. As it says in Isaiah 53, 5, it says that he became our peace for us so that we could be set free. That Jesus set us free from the, the, the curse of sin, from the death that, that that led us to, from the oppression that we were under. And he set us free from the sin in our lives that we can be free indeed. So as we take communion, let's, uh, let's remember Jesus, remember his body that was blood shed for you and his blood, body that was broken for you and his blood that was shed for you and the peace that he wants to give all of us. And I pray that you're ready to fight for him, that you're ready to be a warrior, and that you're also willing to be used by him and willing to step out for him. So let's pray, and we'll take our communion. Uh, Father, we thank you so much for this amazing story. God, I, it's so encouraging the way you use your word in these amazing events and these miracles to, to, to encourage us. God, I feel so much more encouraged just even after studying this out and want to be a warrior for you. God, help us to be your people that fight for you, that love you, that stand up for you, God. Help us to be willing, God. Thank you so much for so many in here who have served you and inspired all of us in so many ways. God, help us to honor Jesus as we remember his death, burial, and resurrection right now and to take this this uh, communion in a way that, that honors you, that we can examine ourselves, God, that we can uh, bring our sins before you, that we can leave here clean in your eyes. We love you. We thank you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.